Where does the royal family live? You might think it's here, but you'd be wrong. In fact, they live here. And their name certainly isn't Windsor. I've made a startling discovery. There's good evidence that's recently come to light that back in the Middle Ages, one of the kings of England was illegitimate. And if that's so, it means that every king and queen of our country since shouldn't by rights have sat on the throne. But if not them, then who? Well, I've traced the real royal family, the bloodline that's been robbed of its inheritance. And I've discovered the person alive today who should be Britain's reigning monarch. This is how it happened. What am I doing making a fuss about a centuries-old skeleton in the royal family's closet? Well, to me, it's all about the rules of the club. The monarchy rests entirely on blood and inheritance. There's an absolutely rigid system for passing on the throne. Prince Charles is first in line, then Prince William, then Harry, then Andrew, etc. The chain of power and wealth and privilege depends on two rules. One, you have to be of the royal bloodline, and two, you have to be born legitimate. But what happens if the system goes wrong, if the chain gets broken? 500 years ago, that's exactly what happened, and this is the man responsible. Edward IV was king, but his claim to the throne was fatally flawed. I found evidence that he was conceived not by his royal father, but by a humble archer. It was the summer of 1441. England was at war with France. Edward's mother had gone there with her husband. While he was away fighting, she was rumoured to have had a fling with an English archer based in the Rouen garrison. Nine months later, Edward was born. Within 20 years, Edward became Edward IV. But gossip about his parentage persisted in his lifetime and even after his death. There were rumours flashing round the Tudor court that Edward was illegitimate, and William Shakespeare actually articulates those rumours. He says in Richard III, if I can find it, um, when that my mother went with child of that insatiate Edward, noble York, my princely father, then had wars in France, and by true computation of the time, found that the issue was not his begot. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But the gossip was just that. There was no proof. Historians put it down to political mudslinging. But then an English historian called Mike Jones started rooting around in the archives at Rouen Cathedral. And he discovered a document that for the first time provided facts to substantiate the rumors that Edward was a bastard. When you came here, what was it you were researching? I was looking into the records of the Hundred Years' War. And you found this thing? This register. What is it? It's a record of the cathedral chapter for the summer of 1441. What's so significant about the summer of 1441? This is when Edward would have been conceived. And what was it that you found? That the Duke of York, his father, is not actually where he should be. He's on campaign in Pontoise. Prayers are being offered for his safety. What does it say? It says, a sermon, a sermon is being preached for the safety of the Duke of York on campaign in Pontoise. So they're worried that he's away at the very time when he was the supposed to be when he was supposed impregnating to be. his wife. Yes. But couldn't the child have been premature? Very, very unlikely. A premature child would have been, that would have been recorded. No one had ever understood the significance of this information before you found it? I couldn't quite believe it myself, that, that something as scandalous and sensational as this could have really happened. 
But this is really definite. This is the original document. It's the original document, and it shows that at the crucial time, from July through to August, the crucial five weeks, the father is not there. Edward was born in late April 1442. Counting back 40 weeks earlier puts his conception right in the middle of the five-week absence of his supposed father. Now, conception dates aren't an exact science, but five weeks is a big gap. Infant mortality was very high. Sick or premature babies with a claim to the throne were a risk, and chroniclers always recorded them. What's more, this new evidence binds together other clues about Edward's birth, which had previously been glossed over. First, the Rouen Cathedral records also tell us that Edward's christening was a hushed-up affair in a side chapel. In contrast, his younger brother had the whole of Rouen Cathedral opened up in celebration. Second, the lantern-jawed Edward looked nothing like the thin-faced man who was supposed to be his father. And thirdly, neutral sources tell us that his mother herself declared that Edward was a bastard, even making a legal deposition. She knew that the truth was vital to the integrity of the royal line. So why does it matter whether or not Edward IV was legitimate? Well, if I stick this up here, hopefully I can show you. This line at the top here is the great line of British kings through from Alfred the Great to Henry the Second to Edward the Third but after Edward suddenly the whole thing explodes it's bush because it's the War of the Roses and all the kings start dying off like flies until in 1485 when Richard the Third dies there are no claimants left except this one Henry the seventh and his claim comes through this line, which is an extremely dodgy one, because it's about the fact that John of Gaunt had a mistress, Catherine, and they had children. And that line is specifically barred from inheriting the crown. So in order to legitimise himself, Henry VII married this woman, Elizabeth of York, and her claim is based on the fact that she is the daughter of Edward IV. But... If Edward IV is illegitimate, then that invalidates the claim of Elizabeth and consequently of Henry and of Henry VIII and of Elizabeth I and of the Georges and of Victoria and everyone all the way down to the House of Windsor. Those few words in an ancient document had potentially seismic results. Edward's illegitimacy removed a vital link from the royal chain. I was about to contest British history as we know it. I wasn't naive. I knew it was impossible to be 100% certain about events that happened 500 years ago. But I wanted to make sure I had the balance of probability on my side. And where better to check 15th century facts than at the Academic World's 15th century conference. Around the time that Luther challenged his colleagues at the University of Wittenberg on the matter of indulgences, another doctor of divinity was exciting to wholly different effect in the much-needed break, I sounded out other opinions about Mike's theory. Do you think that there's a question mark over Edward's legitimacy? I think there is. Um, it was certainly raised at the time, or fairly, fairly close to, uh, to, to the time. It's a dynasty that destroys itself. If you, you start killing your brother and things of this sort, there's something odd going on. It's a very unstable time, I think, under Edward IV. Well, his, his research is very, very thorough and well done. On this particular topic, um, we're talking about an issue where everybody has said it's impossible in the past, it's nonsense, it's rubbish. And what Michael has done is he's shown it's feasible or plausible. I also talked to Mike again, who gave me one more plank of evidence, this time from Edward himself. Edward and his followers seem to have been suspiciously eager to tell the world that he was legitimate. His own circle, once the story gets out, go to the opposite extreme to try and dampen it down. But that's what's so fascinating. So they're bringing out these wonderful eulogies to, to Edward, but they keep having to emphasise what should be obvious. Conceived in wedlock of the royal blood, 
But he's on the throne. <laughs> <laughs> Methinks the lady doth protest too much. Indeed. Yeah. As part of their desperate propaganda campaign, Edward's supporters wanted to deflect attention away from Rouen. So they named an alternative time and place for his conception. The respectable family residence at Hatfield Chase in Yorkshire, before Cecily Neville even left for France. But when we actually look at the, the itinerary of Cecily and Richard, we find they've travelled south by the beginning of June. 1441. So this, this conception would have had to have taken place in May 1441. Why is that a problem? Edward's birth date is the 28th of April 1442. That, <laughs> so is, that is some pregnancy. 11 month pregnancy, yes. So I've heard of trying to strengthen one's case, <laughs> but in the process they've shot themselves in the foot. In other words, when Edward's supporters tried to counter the gossip about his illegitimacy, they came up with a story that would have made him eight weeks overdue, which modern science knows to be impossible. I was ready to start the quest to find who should really be sitting on the throne of Britain today. An ancient document in Rouen Cathedral has shown that King Edward IV was illegitimate. But you're only royalty if you're related to the right people. So Edward's unfortunate beginnings means that every royal since has been unwittingly living a lie. So, if not Henry VIII, good Queen Bess, Queen Victoria, or the present incumbent, then who? Where should the royal line have gone? Forget the history you know, Prepare to meet a Queen Margaret I, a King Henry X, and Queen Barbara I. But in tracing the rightful heirs to the throne, I wanted to follow the established royal rules exactly. As I'm no genealogist, I decided to start at de Bretz, the acknowledged experts on inheritance and the aristocracy. We... We've been doing a lot of work on Richard III and Edward IV, and we've come to the conclusion that Edward IV definitely was illegitimate. But I'm a bit stuck on working out where we should be looking for the true monarchical line once that happens. What, what, what are the rules here? Uh, well, uh, I'll get to family tree and that will help to illustrate this, uh, this question. Uh, the crucial point is that Edward IV was one of three brothers. And it wasn't just Edward IV and Richard III. There was a middle brother, George, Duke of Clarence, who had children. So his children actually would have taken precedence over Richard III. Uh, because here, there's Edward IV. Yeah. There's George, Duke of Clarence. George's two children were the last of the Plantagenets. Edward, Earl of Warwick, who was a poor, simple boy, locked up in the tower where he died, unmarried. But this intriguing lady, Margaret, Countess of Salisbury, was the very last of the Plantagenets, and as such, she was a threat to Henry VIII and the Tudor line. And Henry VIII was determined to get rid of her. Quite late, actually, in his reign, there was a trumped-up charge of treason, and she was um, done to death on the scaffold, and she was complaining to the last breath in her body. And did she have children? Yes, she did. She had quite a few sons. And it's, it's through this line, again through the female line, that we followed this, this line of descent. So I'd found my true Plantagenet heir, the person who should have been on the throne. I'm calling her Queen Margaret I. The Plantagenet claim was so strong that the Tudors made a concerted attempt to wipe them out. Margaret and her sons were executed by Henry VIII. She's now officially a Catholic martyr. But her descendants survived. From Margaret, I had to trace an alternative royal family.
She was the first step on the trail to find our real monarch today, and the trail led me north. The power base of our rightful rulers was a world away from Windsor and Westminster in Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire. Why Ashby? Well, it was the stronghold of the Hastings family. Queen Margaret's granddaughter married into this family. It was the offspring of this Hastings Plantagenet line that I had to follow. Everybody has a family, everybody has roots, and I began to uncover the sort of extraordinary personal stories that everyone finds when they explore their family tree. The only difference was that the Hastings lived in a massive castle, and but for an accident of history, they would have been ruling the country. By the time of Elizabeth I, the heir to Ashby, and therefore our alternative Plantagenet monarch, was Henry Hastings, 3rd Earl of Huntingdon. Forget the bloke with the six wives, this is the real Henry VIII. This Henry was no less vicious than his namesake. Henry was known as the Puritan Earl. Up until now, the Hastings Plantagenets had been staunch Catholics. Don't forget that Henry's great-grandmother, Margaret, had actually been a Catholic martyr. But Henry instituted his own mini-reformation and started persecuting the Catholics zealously. There's one story where he punished a housewife who'd been hiding a Catholic priest by laying her on the ground, putting a door on top of her, and then squashing her to death. Henry was happy to serve the Tudor Queen. He didn't know the rules had been broken, but records show she was only too aware of his pedigree. There's a lovely bit here that says that Queen Elizabeth became ill and she started worrying about the fact that she hadn't got an heir, and someone said to her, don't panic because Henry, Earl of Huntingdon, has got a legitimate claim. And amazingly, she immediately became better. And that was the last time until I came along that there was any hint that the Hastings Plantagenets might actually have a claim to the throne. For hundreds of years, the royal family tree would weave its various branches through British history. It would survive threats and crises, but no one would look back at its roots and suggest the whole line of succession was fatally flawed. 80 years on, the Tudors had been succeeded by their cousins, the Stuarts, and the person wearing the crown was Charles I. When Charles slid to defeat in the English Civil War, the Hastings Plantagenet stood by him to the end. Supporting the king cost them their family seat here at Ashby, which was slighted by Cromwell's troops. Nowadays, if we say we've been slighted, we mean that someone's been a bit sarcastic to us and we feel vaguely miffed. But in the 17th century, slighting meant taking a building back to ground zero. You can see what Cromwell's men did here. They completely blew up half the building. These massive walls completely gone. And the rest of it, they left open to the elements. It was an absolute loss of property and power and status. On their behalf, I was outraged at the irony that our Plantagenet family should have lost so much through sticking by the royals who'd supplanted them. But aristocracy has an uncanny knack of clawing its way back. As I followed the alternative royal family down the centuries and across the country, their depleted fortunes were restored. Ashby was replaced by other magnificent family seats. But then, just as I was well on my way to finding a candidate for Britain's real monarch alive today, I stumbled on a completely unexpected and dramatic clash between our alternative line and the monarch of the day. The Hastings had taken on the title of Earl of Loudoun. This was their enormous castle in Scotland. It was known as the Windsor of the North, 365 rooms. But building it emptied the family bank accounts. In 
It was the first year of the reign of Queen Victoria. Our real monarch at the time should have been George Lord Hastings, the Earl of Loudoun. He had lots of titles, plenty of castles, but very little cash. Which meant that his sister, the Lady Flora, wasn't nearly as eligible as you'd expect an aristocrat to be and wasn't going to be able to marry into the nobility. She'd have to get a job. And she did. She became a lady-in-waiting to the Duchess of Kent, Queen Victoria's mother. And that was the start of big trouble. For the very first time, our royal family hit the headlines. Flora found herself right in the middle of a national scandal. It wasn't her fault. She was the victim of a family feud involving Queen Victoria, Queen Victoria's mother, who Flora was lady-in-waiting to, and a man called Sir John Conroy, who'd been acting as Victoria's unofficial stepfather since Victoria's real father died when she was eight months old. Nowadays, newspapers print gossip about royal sex lives at the drop of a hat. But in 1839, they had to be much more circumspect. Nevertheless, nothing could stop the gossip that Sir John Conroy was far more than her mother's private secretary. Victoria hated him for that. She called him the monstrous devil incarnate. When she came to the throne, she had two ambitions. One was to get rid of all the immorality of the Regency period, and the other was to get rid of Sir John Conroy. And that is where Flora comes in. In 1838, Flora travelled down from Scotland in a carriage with Sir John Conroy. They were alone, no chaperone. There were rumours. And when months later Flora's stomach started to swell, gossip about a pregnancy became rife. It was Victoria's perfect chance to get back at Conroy. She banned Flora from court and ordered her to have an intimate examination. Victoria's high-handed attitude destroyed our Plantagenet princess's reputation. It brought Victoria into direct conflict with Flora's brother, our alternative monarch. It's all here. The examination proves that Flora's a virgin and is actually very ill. George and his family and the whole nation are outraged by Victoria's treatment of poor Flora. Listen to this from the Morning Post. Lady Flora Hastings endures with patience and resignation the anguish of a wounded spirit. A virtuous and amiable lady destroyed in the flower of her days by the slanders and the insults of court minions. Of course, they couldn't actually criticise the Queen openly, but everyone knew what the phrase court minions really referred to. This incident ended the young Victoria's honeymoon period with the British public. This is the dramatic moment in history when our alternative royal family dared to stand up to the person on the throne. Not only that, but the people mobilised behind them. Crowds jeered and hissed Victoria. Eggs were thrown at her carriage. This is big news. This is the Watergate of its time. Imagine it, when Princess Di died in the car crash and the Queen's popularity was at its lowest, no one actually took to the streets. But here, with this incident of the eggs, you can see the level of public outrage. But it got even worse because in the July, Flora died of liver cancer. Here's her obituary just there. Public now were at boiling point. Queen Victoria could scarcely go out of the palace, whereas Flora was regarded as a victim, some kind of martyr figure almost. But what the newspapers can't show you is what was going on in private. Her brother George challenged Lord Melbourne, who was the Queen's chief representative, to a duel. He couldn't challenge the Queen herself, of course, because she was a woman. In other words, here you've got our Plantagenet George IV going head to head with the chief representative of the heir to the Tudor throne. In the event, the duel never took place. But the tragedy was neither forgiven nor forgotten by the Hastings family. They issued their own stamps in her memory. Flora was buried in state at Loudoun. The Union flag was never flown again over the castle.
the publicity about flora made my research easier. But later on in Victoria's reign, our alternative royal family were hit by a massive change in their fortunes. In a dramatic twist of fate, the noble Plantagenets were torn off their pedestal. It was an event that totally transformed my search for the person who should be on the throne today. This was the man responsible, Henry Waysford Charles Plantagenet Rawdon Hastings. He was, frankly, a bounder. He even stole his friend's fiancée, but he had only one real love in his life. Henry was married to the track. As soon as he came of age, he started to run horses and bet heavily. Can I have uh, tennis or in on Turner? Number seven, ten pounds. If I wanted to make a really big bet here, would you take it? It depends how big a bet you're talking about, really. Five and a half million. I think you might struggle. Certainly a good would anyway. I've never heard of anyone having a, asking for a bet bigger than a million pound, but there was a, uh, somebody asked for a million pound bet last year. What would you think of someone who put five and a half million quid on the horse? I think they've either got too much money or they're just trying to get rid of some for somebody else. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what Henry Hastings did. He'd already spent virtually all of the family fortune, about £100 million in today's money. He just got £120,000 left. That's five and a half million today. And he put it all on one horse in one race to win. It was the 22nd of May, 1867, the Derby. Henry had backed the odds-on favourite, the Dunn. Step, he got closer. <laughs> the line, the hermit won by a neck. The sport of kings had destroyed our King Henry the Tenth. By the age of 25, our Henry X had frittered away the family fortune, running up millions of pounds of debts. He got another name, the King of the Plungers. A year later, his liver gave out. On his death, the family were forced to auction wines, art and the family estates to pay his creditors. Loudon Castle today is a shell overlooking a theme park complete with rides and wallabies to attract the masses. Suddenly, our alternative line had run slap-bang into the real world. I realised that the real king or queen today probably wasn't some toff living in a stately home, but an ordinary person in a normal house. As I traced the last few generations, I found the truth. From the 20th century, there were more names and faces. Tragic deaths in both world wars that meant we should have had both a Queen Edith and, until last year, the Queen Barbara the first and then suddenly I was there I couldn't quite believe it but I had a name and an address for the person who should be ruling Britain today in 1960 when the present occupant of Buckingham Palace was still in the first decade of her reign a young man set sail from England he was heading for a new life abroad he didn't know it but he was leaving his kingdom behind. Good morning. After discovering a flaw in the royal succession, I traced the line of true kings and queens that leads to the person who's Britain's real monarch. But he'd emigrated. The true heir to the throne was born in Britain, but now lives in the Australian outback. That's all there is to it. That's it. 
Not that much difficulty finding him there, should we? Wouldn't think so. Should we go down and have a look? Yeah, sounds good. His name is Michael Hastings. Armed only with my family tree and my increasing obsession with the subject, I went to tell the man who should be King Michael I the good news. As I drove into Gerildaree, New South Wales, population 1100 plus one king, I began to realise how daft this might look. I knew he was in town. I'd phoned him from Britain and told him we were looking into the descendants of the Plantagenets. But otherwise, King Michael was in the dark. Twelve thousand miles, two and a half days, and a lot of jet lag, and uh, I'm finally here. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure how to play this. I mean, if someone turned up on your doorstep and said, "Excuse me, do you know that you're the King of England?" You'd be a bit surprised, wouldn't you? Particularly if they had uh, a director with them and a sound man and a cameraman. So I think what I'll do is I'll just talk to him about some of the facts first of all relax him a bit and then uh, hit him with the uh, real import of what we've got to say at the end. G'day. Hello, uh, Michael. Uh, yes, come on you. I'm Tony Robinson. This Hello, is, Tony. How are you? This is our camera crew. Come on, come on in. Thank you. Would you walk? Uh, not from England, no. Michael, the reason that we've come over is that we've been doing a lot of research on the Plantagenets, of which you are... The one, yes. A very distinguished very, one. Very, well, very distant one, too. Just looking at the, the top bit, see, the kings of England, starting with Henry II mm -hmm. and further back, right to William the Conqueror, and beyond that to Alfred the Great, I went over the now familiar pattern. Wars of the Roses, Clarence, Henry Tudor, and of course the missing link in the royal chain. All of that's okay, except that we now believe that Edward IV was himself illegitimate. illegitimate. Which means that Elizabeth was illegitimate, Henry VII was illegitimate anyway, so this whole Tudor dynasty is built on a lie. Hmm. It means that you mm. are the rightful king of England. Well, there you are. How do you feel about that? Bloody awful, isn't it? <laughs> I don't. <know. laughs> Bit of a shock, isn't it? <laughs> Bit of a shock. Has it ever crossed your mind before? No, it hasn't, actually. But you knew you were a Plantagenet. Well, uh, yes, I just said, oh, yeah, well, you go back so far and you somewhere along the line, you're a Plantagenet, you know. But I didn't think it would work. I, well, I didn't know anything about this. This bit, the illegitimacy bit. Yeah. Oh, wow. It turned out that Michael also had a family tree. He wanted to check my research, which luckily seemed to match completely. Well, there's, 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 there's Theophilus. Yeah, 1729 to 1789. And then he had a, a, a son and a daughter, Francis. They were all there. Margaret the Martyr, Lady Flora, our gambling Henry X, as well as Michael's nearer relatives. She'd have been Edith the First. Twelfth Countess, yeah. Then that's my great grandmother. That's your great grandmother. That's your mother, Barbara. Barbara. Barbara, Barbara Huddleston had me hasty. Barbara would have been Barbara the First. So she died last year. Strictly speaking, Michael isn't Mr. Hastings. He's a peer of the realm. You are an earl yourself, aren't you? Yes. What? Well, what? Earl of Loudon. I came over here in 1960, um, and uh, I inherited. At that stage, I was Lord Morkland because my mother was still alive. Yeah. She had the title. And then last October, she died. I was in, in England at the time, and she died. Yeah. And I inherited her title. And then my oldest son, 
inherited mine. So if you're an English lord, what are you doing over here? I love it over here. I came over here when I was 17, 1960, and I just love it over here. I married here, I have five children, five grandchildren, and a wonderful life. But what Michael hadn't twigged was that as King of the United Kingdom, he'd also have the remnants of an empire, including Australia. They're looking for a new Governor General at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite serious in a way, though, isn't it? If... Well, it is, really. It depends, if, well, it depends how seriously you take it. You see, I believe that Australia should be a republic. I'm not a mad monarchist. So in the referendum, how did you vote? For a republic. So you'd have been voting against yourself, had you Well, been <laughs> yeah, I suppose I would have done if I'd... Well, I, I might have voted different. <laughs> <laughs> Two of Michael's daughters also live in Gerildery. <laughs> Princess Rebecca and Princess Mandy, with the young Prince Riley, took a bit more convincing than their father had done. All the way down to here, to your grandmother, Barbara, which means that when Barbara died, Michael, became king of England. <laughs> You're right. Became the true king of England. This is the king of England, which means that you two <laughs> yeah. are princesses. It doesn't mean, like it does mean, but really. You've got to remember, this lot aren't just going to step aside That's and say, right. here, I'll take over. Well, I don't know if you've got an army together. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> this is real stuff. This is real proper. We are the true. It just doesn't mean we're not believing people. <laughs> okay, you want the facts. There's only, there's only one way to guarantee the facts, and that is via DNA. Would you be prepared to let us have a little piece of your hair, and we can run the DNA check and make sure that this is true? The history is very big. Have you got a pair of scissors? I don't know, Dad, if you're going to He needs all the hair he can get. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a lot of hard work. I could just take the pennies off. Oh, you could, yes, but, well, no. <laughs> I'm going to laugh if it turns out wrong. Someone's been playing up somewhere. <laughs> take my natural colour. <laughs> Goodness, where do you want me to take it from? <laughs> In my naivety, I thought you could get DNA from any old hair. Actually, you need the root and gloves. But they humoured me. So there I was, after half an hour, messing about with people whose blood gave them more right to the throne than starchy old Prince Charles. <laughs> now, well, that's royal hair, that is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> do you think that's funny? Do you think you are a little prince? No. <laughs> Why not? Because no. Hello? So, so we've got Prince Caleb, and and what are the other children? Isabella. And, uh, um, Jet. <laughs> Princess. Prince. Prince Jet. J no, that, <laughs> that will be a new one. He's a twenty-first century prince. He he's a card. Yeah, and Zach. Prince Zach and Prince Jet. Yeah. That is so cool. And Riley. And what was your mum's name? Nolly. No, that, oh, what a pity that she's not alive now. So no, Very. She would have been just... Queen oh. <laughs> that would have been so lovely. I, I, I won't even say what she would have said. <laughs> <laughs> because she can't say it on the television. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, she wasn't really into it much at all, was she, Kate? Up until that moment, my quest had been a bit of a game. But meeting Michael... I really liked the sheer normality of his life and was actually rather touched by his bluff republicanism. I began seriously to think about not only what he'd lost, but also what he'd gained by not being King of Britain. Moral, not Sandringham, not Windsor, but Gerildery in Australia, home to Britain's real monarch. Because if you think this is the royal family, think again. According to my calculations, this should be King Michael I, and his family include Simon, the alternative Prince of Wales, Marcus, Lisa, Princes Jet, Zach, Caleb and Riley, not forgetting little Princess Isabella. 
Queen Elizabeth II's day is planned minute by minute, including a piper who plays at nine o'clock after the royal breakfast. She spends her time going through the royal rituals, pressing the flesh with ambassadors or aging celebrities, anyone who needs the boost of pomp and circumstance. Michael's day begins at 7.30, when he sets out on a half-hour drive to work. He works at the Australian Rice Research Institute. It's an enormous farm where Michael and two mates are engaged on an ongoing quest to find a sort of rice suitable for the parched landscape to feed Australia and Southeast Asia. Yeah, I don't know what fertiliser we've got left, Mike, but oh, sorry, we'll have a look. Do you want to start, start, start chucking them in the bed food? All right. I'll, Matt and I might try and work out what's in the Others. other bins. One of the interesting things about our Plantagenet King is that he started off as a standard British public schoolboy with a title. But something in his character transformed him into a regular Aussie bloke who'd vote to get rid of the monarchy. Like Prince Harry, Michael came to Australia to do some jackarooing in a sort of gap year. But his temporary stay became permanent. After a couple of other jobs, I joined a company called Dennis Lascelles. They were a stocking station agency. A stocking station agency over here is a combination of kind of buying and selling properties and sheep and cattle and all that kind of thing. And they sent me to Geraldry, and that's how I started in Geraldry, and that was in 1966. And I've been there ever since. It's a very small town. What's in it for you? The casualness, the friendship, the lifestyle. That's the bit I like. After only a couple of days in the bush, I could see what attracted our real king to the tough but uncomplicated Australian lifestyle. I mean, I'd check if you did that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you start getting into the swing, there's always someone happy to point out that you're still a pom. Forty years on, I'm still a pom, or that pommy bastard, you know, one or the other. Yeah. Oh yes, well that, that's that's typical Australian. Man. Oh yes. You know, I, I, I don't think I'll ever become a local. It doesn't rankle. No, not at all. Not at all. I spent more time with Michael at work and off duty. He showed me the sights of Gerildery. To be frank, I'm a city person. I'd have gone mad here after more than a week. But at the same time, I envied him. Compared with the dysfunctional Windsors, our Plantagenet monarch lives right at the heart of a close-knit family and community. Whatever the gags and put-downs, it seemed to me that he'd made a life for himself out here that was far better than any that he could have had as King of Britain. Friggin working. At least I turn up. What do you friggin do after time? My wife had red hair. She was fairly fiery. I think I was not quite 21 when I met Noel, and I was 26 when we got married. Um, she probably thought, oh, can I really marry a pommy? What do you think Nolene, an all-Australian girl, would have said if she'd known that she was really the Queen of England? I think she would have probably said, get me another stubby, Michael. I think I'm going to need it. If the Queen abdicated, if she said, I've had enough of it, would you go back? Probably not. Probably not. And I couldn't blame him. But I still wondered what Britain would have been like if our alternative history had happened. We wouldn't have had Henry VIII, so Britain might still be a Catholic country like Ireland. And Britain was only formed because James VI of Scotland became James I of England as well. 
so there'd be an independent Scotland with its own king. And what about our current royals? Well, we've never had the House of Hanover either, so maybe, just maybe, somewhere in Germany today, a very ordinary and elderly lady, who may or may not be called Elizabeth, goes to buy a few slices of breakfast. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got the answer to the question I was asking myself. I now know who should be ruling Britain in another reality. Except, of course, in real life, things are just as they are. King Michael's far too happy down under to think about storming across the seas to occupy Britain and seize Buckingham Palace. So, if that's the case, what was the purpose of the whole exercise? Well, for me, I really understand something now about the nature of history itself. It's fragile. It's accidental. For instance, this is Ashby de la Zouche Castle. It's the epitome of the kind of power that the Hastings had when they were at the height of their dominance. It's strong, it's big, it's confident. Whereas over there is the little house where Michael's mother lived for most of her life. It's unassuming, it's modest, it's normal, just like Michael himself, a million miles away from all the trappings of monarchy. Which reminds me of the medieval notion of the Wheel of Fortune, where some people rise up while others are cast down below. And that makes me think of the whole career path of the Plantagenet family. What would have happened if people had cottoned on to the fact that Edward was a bastard much earlier? Or if Henry Hastings' horse had come in first, not second? We tend to think nowadays of the monarchy as such a solid institution, whereas in fact wealth and privilege and power and status just hang by a thread. There's no such thing as the divine right of kings. Because we haven't even started to talk about the enormous power that the monarch's got even today. No, well, that's right. They, uh, they, I suppose a lot of the power's been taken, but... Uh... There's still some around. Do you fancy knighting me? Oh, I don't see why not. Yeah? What would you like to be? I'll just have a look around here. Oh, look at that. Sir Tony of uh, Horseferry Road? Horseferry Road? God, yeah. where's that? Victoria. I W Sir Tony of Horseferry Road. Arise, Sir Tony. Thank you very much. I feel better for that. Oh, look, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I've got a spring in my step. Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. Do we get a barbecue tonight? <laughs>